Speaking today with George Dick of Dickland Farms uh, in Chilliwack, British Columbia, Canada. George milks 300 registered Holsteins there, and he has been speaking uh, to the National DHI Convention here in Savannah, Georgia, uh, the first week in March. George, uh, I think your presentation, your talk went over very well with the audience. You made some very interesting points, and uh, we appreciate you speaking with us. Yeah, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, early in your talk, uh, you made a statement that caught my ear, and I think others too. You said uh, uh, you're a huge believer in genetic gain. Uh, maybe not a surprise for uh, a breeder, but uh, you, you made that statement very strongly, and then you went on to talk about it. What, what, what's your point of view there? Well, I think, uh, you know, we all on the surface believe in genetic gain, but when you... Uh, are we making management decisions based on it, and are we are we truly believing those numbers? And I think um, you know I, I have chosen to believe those numbers and work with them, and, and they've proved out well on my farm. And so uh, you know I I am not a skeptic; I'm a believer. Uh, maybe to back that point up, you showed a, in your presentation a picture of two of the baby calves on your farm. Uh, they were young calves, looked good, healthy. Uh, they had significantly different genetic values. Uh, one was quite high, one was more modest. Uh, and you said you'd think that there would be a difference in value there, but oftentimes in the marketplace that doesn't seem to be the case. What, what's the lesson there? Yeah, and I think that comes back to uh, generally as, as uh, I will say not industry, but as farmers, do we believe the numbers uh, that are associated with the genetic test and the data that went into it? Um, and I and I also feel that uh, you know we we anecdotally always have in our own herds cows that we thought were going to do great that didn't, um, and but that can be for a variety of reasons. So I think I think there's just uh, for most farmers there's a little bit of uh, a little gun shy maybe in in truly believing the numbers, but we have to always remember that it's it's not uh, every cow every time. There's a percentage there that for whatever reason, don't perform, whether they've had disease or whatever uh, previously. So uh, we have to remember it's on average that that occurs, that those predictions occur. Sure. Uh, you also talked about uh, new traits uh, that you would uh, be interested in having access to as a dairyman, as a breeder. Uh, you mentioned a couple of feed efficiency, uh, the initials, uh, IOF, KGB, uh, acidosis and rumination trait or, or habits in cattle uh, or differences perhaps I should yeah. say and then uh, healthy calves uh, those are four different items just just talk a little bit about them and how, how you see that yeah so I think uh, for the for the simplest one really to explain is the uh, income over feed per for kg of butter fat um, you know because in Canada the way our permitting works uh, we're limited on how many kgs of butter fat we produce so that's really the driving unit of of production is, is kgs of butter fat and income over feed if we looked over the entire herds many you know always we we're always looking over the herds but we know individuals perform better within that herd and and so the feed efficiency index I uh, you know if we can get the reliability into it is going to be a very tremendous change for the industry um, I think it's it's going to be it's going to be massive if we get that data and so I, I look forward to that I think that's going to um, it's going to really open the eyes to efficiency on, for some people and, and seeing which cows were actually making you the money uh, versus the others. Um, and if we look at um, another trait, you know, the hoof health issue, uh, I think that's that, you know, another set of eyes getting the data from uh, hoof trimmers, the people that are working on hooves in multiple different um, farms, they're going to give such good information, real data. Uh, even to the simplicity of this cow has been trimmed multiple times more than this other cow. You know, that's a very simple thing, but it can be, have really profound uh, cost savings. Um, the, the rumination part, the rumination acidosis, I really, I, um, I really believe that the standards that we have for what cows can do have been changed over time because of genetics, and, and I think rules of thumb are not what they used to be. And so... Having, if we had some real feedback on rumination and we use that to kind of gauge 
our grain intakes on a per animal or per herd basis, um, I think there's gains to be made there um, in efficiency as well because uh, there are cows that are much more consistent ruminators uh, than, than others and fresh cows and all those things. So I think that would be a, a tremendous, you know, uh, call it rumination, call it acidosis resistance sure. uh, indicator. Um, yeah, and then uh, what was the, uh, the other one was... Uh, the healthy calves. You yeah, calves. Kind of being able to predict uh, how calves might perform. Yeah, and I think we, we always uh, look about, we always talk about cows, but nobody, you know, breeds and uh, has a cow. They have a calf. Uh, we, we all start with calves. And, you know, we we need to, we know that from the data that we've seen with whether, whether it's uh, colostrum and immunity, we, such a difference that makes in first lactation. So, Maybe we need to go back to the data and go specifically how do those calves perform from every particular sire. So I think I think if we could tie that in, um, I think we'd get great result. Sure. Good. Well, thank you. We've been speaking with George Dick of Dicklin Farms in British Columbia. Uh, we're at the National DHI Convention in Savannah, Georgia. And uh, this is Joel Hastings speaking for DairyBusiness.com.